Bloomberg, you were just listening to closing arguments in the George Birch murder trial, a trial going on right now out of Wisconsin. You can see the judge is on the bench right now. He is giving some final instructions, talking about dismissing an alternative juror. Um, and I want to bring in my guest, David DiPietro, who has been watching these closings. David, are you there? I'm here. How are you? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Wow. Okay. So basically, I didn't know at times who was who. Was it uh, uh, the prosecution giving their their uh, closing? Was it the defense? It was hard to tell because both were trying to disprove a theory. Of course, the prosecution was trying to say that it was George Birch that did this. And the defense was trying to prove their story, which was that it was Douglas Dietrich who did it and that it was not their client. Uh, what did you make of this? It's a, this is a fascinating trial for everybody to watch because most murder trials, uh, generally a defendant won't testify and, and they'll just challenge the state as to whether they met their burden. This case is fascinating in that not only did the defendant testify, but it's not, not like some other murder cases where they might say it was an accident or self-defense. They, they actually came up with an entire alternative theory and actually pointed the finger at another person as the murderer. So uh, the audience is getting a, a, a unique case that is, is very rarely hashed out in a courtroom in the United States the way this one has happened. I think the prosecution ultimately has a much stronger case than the theory presented by the defense. But remember, you only need to hang up one for a hung jury. Uh, and you never know what a jury is going to do uh, if they find reasonable doubt. Even if they think uh, Birch did it, they might believe he did it. But if they find reasonable doubt, then they, they must acquit. So this is going to be a fascinating outcome, I think, uh, for this potential verdict. Well, the prosecutor said it when she first began her closing arguments, which is this is a case of who done it. They believe it was George Birch. The defense says it's Douglas Dietrich, and they point to all these different pieces of evidence as proof of that. What did you make? Because I know you were sitting on here on the line listening to the closing specifically by the defense as a defense attorney yourself. Did he do a good enough job of piecing together the evidence to paint Douglas Dietrich as the killer? And I'll mind you, it's not his obligation to do that as defense attorney. All he has to do is say that his client didn't do it. That aside, what did you make of it? I, I think he, he didn't do as good as the prosecution because I don't think his facts are as good. It's not that his advocacy was, uh, was uh, less. It's just the facts weren't all there for him. But remember, he only needs to throw in one, one red herring, one, um, one doubt in their mind on one piece of evidence. And he kind of went through multiple uh, pieces of evidence to rely on to hang up a jury. And... I think he did a good job advocating uh, for, for particular issues that could hang up a potential jury. You never know with 12 people what somebody might get caught on to, what they might hang on to. So I think he did a nice job in his closing. Uh, I think the prosecution is going gonna, is gonna to get their conviction. But uh, I think the defense attorney did. He did a fairly nice job in, in trying to, uh, to paint reasonable doubt with the evidence that was entered in the case. And if we can, if you don't mind, if we just take a quick look inside of court so we can see what's going on, um, it looks like the judge is now just giving some final closing instructions to the jurors. Um, this is a case where there is one charge, first degree intentional homicide. The, the jurors do not have the option of including any lesser charges like second degree. Sometimes um, that is allowed. In this case, it's first degree intentional homicide. Here's something that maybe, David, you can uh, make me understand a little bit better. Throughout the closings and throughout the case, the prosecution has contended that George Birch violently raped 31-year-old Nicole Vanderheiden. OK, they showed evidence of this through the medical examiner, the abrasions that she had in her private area. OK, so why didn't they charge him with sexual assault or rape? I don't understand that. Probably because obviously the witness to it is now deceased. So to prove rape, one of the issues needs to be consent um, without the victim being alive. Uh, they might have just had rough sexual intercourse uh, would be a logical explanation as to some of the uh, injuries she received. So 
without her saying it was not consensual or without some sort of other piece of evidence tying that together, it's hard to prove whether it was consensual or not. And the, 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 I think the reason the prosecution put in the evidence is, is it goes to motives, motive that he, that he did rape her, which they don't need to prove. But because of that, that was the motive for him to then kill her so that it would cover up the rape. That, so it seems that's probably the logical explanation as why the prosecutor intertwined all these facts into a theory on the case. Okay, so basically, the, the, uh, of course, the prosecution doesn't have to put forward a motive. It always helps the jurors to understand the case and per perhaps get a conviction. The, the, the motive that they put forward is basically Nicole Vanderheiden, who you just saw there on your screen, that beautiful young woman from the Green Bay area, a mom only 31 years old, um, that uh, she wouldn't comply with him, that she wouldn't have sex with him. And he grew angry and distraught, uh, and that's why he killed her. He, he raped her and then he killed her. On the flip side of that, you have the defense's theory, which is that Douglas Dietrich, Nicole Vander Heiden's live-in boyfriend, walked in on them having sex at the car, and there's the picture of the two of them, got jealous, and then killed Nicole. I think the prosecution made a really good point in the rebuttal, and um, that was, if he killed Nicole and had knocked out uh, George Birch, when George Birch came to, and this was the dude who had just had sex with your, <laughs> with, with your, your, your girlfriend, so you're just going to be like, hey, man, let's get rid of the body? Like, aren't you going to be pissed at him? Maybe try to punch him out if you're drunk? Like, that didn't make sense to me. Yeah, I, I think you're right. And I think some of the most compelling evidence was Birch's uh, uh, actions after the fact. I mean, if he thought he was involved in this, you know, something where somebody got hurt or he had knowledge of it, to, to, he, to have your friends testify that you didn't mention it or speak about it. To me, when you have people that are, are your friends and they're, they're corroborating the prosecution side, from a weight weight of the evidence, if you have to weigh the evidence, the level of credibility, it's gonna it's gonna weigh pretty heavy for the prosecution. So, I think that, that for me, just watching as a, a bystander uh, and listening to the evidence, not knowing anything about the case other than before uh, law and crime started following it, I think to me that was some of the most compelling evidence. Is you, is you how you act after the fact uh, really can show that you were culpable and the one behind the entire uh, crime. Okay, David, so you're, if you don't mind just sticking around for a few more minutes, uh, you've been patient here as we've been listening uh, to these closings. But for folks that might just be joining us and only got to see uh, the defense closings and maybe the rebuttal, I want to take us back to a little bit earlier when we heard the prosecution's closing argument. Just a short clip of that so that David and I can discuss. As we indicated, as we expected, this case isn't one in where we're all going to be arguing about intent. That's not going to be an issue. That wasn't an issue with respect to the testimony presented. That doesn't seem to be a question that you need to make a determination on. It's very clear by the vicious actions that took place by the actor involved in her death, intent to kill is self-evident. This is clearly a whodunit case. We told you at the start of this case that the evidence would form a path, and that path would lead you to the truth and lead you to finding justice for Nicole. You need only to follow that path, and we ask you to apply your intelligence, your common sense, and your reason. And when you do so, you'll find the defendants guilty. This is basically a simple case. Who has been proven to have been with Nikki in the last hours of her life on May 21st, 2016, in those early morning hours? Who has been proven unequivocally to have been with her? in her last moments. What does the independent scientific and technical evidence tell us on that point? What does it show? Whose DNA is on her sock? The sock he left behind on her battered body. The crime lab leads us to the defendant with that hit. He's with her in her last moments. What other evidence do we have as to who is with her? The key questions in this case, the Google dashboard, who's with Nikki at the four key areas of Brown County? She's last seen by 
by Aaron Kalinske at the sardine can. We know the defendant's really close by before that at Richard Cranium's, a very short walk. Then where does he end up? The defendant's phone continues to track him, continues to place him, it continues to implicate him. It puts him on the murder scene on Berkeley. Then, third spot, it places the defendant at the spot, the field on Hoffman, where he dumps her body. So I thought this prosecutor in the closing arguments in the George Birch murder trial was pretty effective. Uh, Doug, what did you think? I'm sorry, David, what did you think? It's okay. No, I, I, I think she was strong. I think both the prosecutors, I actually think all the lawyers in this case were very strong. They look like they try a lot of cases in their area. So um, the audience got to see really good advocacy on both sides. I, I think uh, they're all very quality attorneys. And the defense attorney in this case was a public defender. Um, so that's always interesting, too, to see. Sometimes you get different quality of attorney if, if they're a public defender. But I'm with you. Uh, I thought both sides did a, a pretty strong uh, pretty strong closing arguments. What do you think is going to happen? So it looks like we're about to go into deliberations. I'm not sure. Okay, yes, we are in verdict watch now. So the jurors in the George Birch murder trial have been discharged. They have left the courtroom and they are now going into deliberations. I'd expect they probably have some lunch first and then they're going to get into some hard work this afternoon. As they get into that, what do you expect? Do you think this is going to take a while for them to get through the evidence? Will it be a short deliberations? We just never know. You never really know. I, I, I wouldn't suspect it's 2 o'clock now that we get a verdict today. It's probably going to be at the earliest tomorrow. Um, yeah, so I don't, I don't see what the, the amount of time in the trial, and unless they just think it was a slam dunk, which I think there was too much evidence for them to discuss, for them to just go back and say slam dunk. Um, so it's it's it'll be interesting to see how long it takes. But I, if I were a betting man, I wouldn't put the green on the mahogany that, that is coming back today. <laughs> uh, David, I, I would agree with you. There's a lot in this case. And that's because not only do you have the prosecution's theory to contend with, you also have the defense's theory of the case, most importantly. And we saw him on the stand all of yesterday. George Birch, the defendant himself, had to. He really had to take the stand in this case because he had to explain what happened. I want David to stick around and weigh in because I know you watched some of that testimony, David, and I want you to weigh in into how he came off in front of the jurors. First, we're going to listen to a short recap of what happened when he was on the stand. The man authorities say murdered a woman after a drunken hookup took the witness stand in his own defense. You were having intercourse with her? Yes, sir. What ended up happening? Um, the next thing that I remember, apart from us having intercourse, was literally waking up on the ground outside the truck, laying in, in the like, grass curb area. Birch presumes he was knocked out by the victim's boyfriend, who he did not know at the time. It was fairly dark. Um, I saw someone that looked like a, like a hooded sweatshirt. Uh, couldn't really see any faces, uh, just glimpse. Um, standing behind me, uh, it looked like it was like in this direction and which appeared to be a firearm in his hand. The boyfriend ordered him to the back of his SUV where he says he saw the victim's body. It kind of freaked me out even farther when seeing this because she was literally, from what I remember the last time, she was, we were in the car having sex. And the next thing I know, she's literally laying on the concrete right in front of me. He says the boyfriend ordered him at gunpoint to pick up the victim, put her in his SUV, and drive to a rural area where he says he was ordered to leave the victim's body. Then he says he made his getaway. Everything I had, I lunged at him and pushed him as hard as I possibly could at, at that time. <coughs> Did he fall down? I don't know. I, he stumbled backwards. Um, did he fall down? I don't know because I broke for it. What'd you do? Hauled ass to my car, or my truck. Birch said he didn't report any of this to the authorities because he was on parole in a theft case and was afraid nobody would believe him. Prosecutors challenged the entire story. 
what really happened was you drove Nicole home 20 miles away from where you lived, fully expecting that you were going to have sex, right? I was hoping that we would. Um, it was leading from what had happened before and where we had spoken. It seemed like that's what was going to happen. And when you get there, and it becomes clear that Nikki isn't going to have sex with you, when she attempts to go into her house and leave your vehicle, that's when your mood changes, right? No, sir. That's when things get aggressive, don't they? Not at all. The boyfriend, Doug Dietry, said earlier he had nothing to do with Vander Hayden's death. The jury will have to decide whether to believe Dietry or Birch. This is Aaron Keller for the Law and Crime Network. Well, there you go, George Birch on the stand yesterday, and you can bet as those jurors are deliberating right now in the George Birch murder trial that they are carefully, uh, piece by piece, going through George Birch's testimony. I'm here alongside David DiPietro. David, you just heard some clips. I know you listened to some of George Birch's testimony yourself. What do you make of it? He came off unbelievable, but surprisingly a good witness. I don't know if that's really maybe intertwined one and the same. I, I think he was he was uh, wasn't tripped up. I think he he was very well coached. I think he anticipated the questions well. He wasn't caught off guard. I think what he said though, when you intertwine it with the facts and the evidence, doesn't make sense. What a reasonable person would do under that circumstance. But I think he was pretty composed as a witness. Um, and, and had probably practiced in front of the mirror for a long time. Yeah, that's funny that you say that because that was the exact reaction that um, I had to his testimony. It's like he was anticipating every single question and he had it down in his notes. They had gone over it in the uh, attorney's office or wherever at his home and he knew what he was going to say. However, uh, during some of the cross-examination, I'm not sure if you saw that, it did get a little bit tense. He did get a little bit, I wouldn't say angry yelling, but he fought back a little bit to the prosecutor. In your mind, did that come off as someone that could easily explode or someone that's defending them themselves if they're really innocent? No, I, 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 I remember that part where he came back sort of come, a little bit combative on some of the questions and, and you know, it's cross-examination and they, they ask you, you know, uh, questions, uh, how, how often do you beat your wife questions? And sometimes that gets frustrating when you get one of those over and over again. So I think that I, I think his his he got angry or aggravated, but I don't think it rose to the level of uh, showing that he's a psycho in front of the jury uh, or anything like that. So I, I overall, he was pretty composed uh, and um, was surprised how well he how well he actually carried himself with the questions. You know, once, one thing that I always think about, because it is kind of rare for the defendants to take the stand um, in these, these criminal trials, but weirdly enough, here at the Law and Crime Network, we happen to choose trials where the defendant takes the stand a lot. I don't know why that is. But one thing that always goes through my mind is, if this guy is really guilty, I, I don't know why, and I don't know maybe if jurors think this too, if this guy is really guilty, why would he go up there and lie in front of everybody? You know what I mean? Like, like I, it makes me want to believe someone more in the fact that they're actually telling their story. Well, <laughs> and narcissists are narcissists, and and psychos are psychos. True. And you can't you can't really put make logical illogical people logical. I mean, some people are just um you know they're pathological and they they can just lie and, they, and this is part of their modus operandi so i, I the fact that they testify does, i don't i i as a when i was a prosecutor i was surprised what i would call test the line how many people <laughs> just get up on the stand and just lie test i mean lie. just lie yeah. it's okay. amazing so it's, speaking it's, of Speaking of lying, <laughs> what made you think he was lying on the stand? It, it's just because the it, it, how he his story could have been believable if his subsequent actions backed it up. Uh, you know, if he ran away and got out of there like holy hell, like he said, why didn't he call the police? Do anything? Tell anybody? Why did he go, throw the clothes? Okay, why did he throw the clothes then out of the window of his car? After this had all happened, if he if, if it was someone else making him do it, I mean that wouldn't be the first thing you're going to do, right? Throw the clothes out, then go home, 
take a shower and wash your bloody clothes? Yeah, I mean, ha and so the jurors have to be saying to themselves, I've never thrown bloody clothes out of uh, a car after having sex with a woman or, or having sexual intercourse. So it just comes off as bizarre and unbelievable. Uh, so that's why I think his testimony is good. But when you think about it in totality, you're like, no, it's just all made up and it just doesn't make sense. Well, I mean, he's certainly pieced together. It's like he was wait. If it is made up, like we think, and I, I tend to agree with you, he certainly pieced together a very interesting and intricate story uh, uh, of what happened. Uh, again, if you're just joining us here on the Law and Crime Network, we are on verdict watch. Finally, in the George Birch murder trial, the trial we've been following gavel to gavel here on the network. We just heard those closing arguments. You just heard some of that testimony replayed of George Birch, and now it is in the jurors' hands. We are standing by, and if there's any action in court in Wisconsin, we will bring you there. In the meantime, uh, we are going to take a short break, and when we come back, another interesting story about an actress, Rose McGowan who is accused uh, of drug charges, and she says it was all one big elaborate setup. Let's talk about that when we come back. And welcome back, everybody. I'm your host. This is the Law and Crime Network, and we're following another really interesting story. It's involving the actress Rose McGowan, who is facing felony drug possession charges uh, for uh, something that happened on a United flight at Dulles International Airport on January 20th, 2017. Investigators found cocaine in her wallet. Okay, you see Harvey Weinstein's face there. Well, he's involved in this story, okay? Stay with me here. Rose McGowan accused Harvey Weinstein of rape. She is now claiming, in an attempt to get her felony drug charges dismissed, that this may have all been an elaborate setup by, quote, the Harvey Weinstein machine, who was trying to retaliate against her, her for speaking out against him. Okay, I hope you got that all straight. It's a little bit of a convoluted story. I want to bring in David again. David, what do you make of this? It seems a little elaborate. It's like the new common law defense is going to be the Harvey Weinstein defense, right? right. Like, like, you can blame this guy for everything at this point. Um, and global warming, it's his fault. I mean, it's just, I don't know. I guess it's, it, it, you got to come up with something, right? I mean, the cocaine was in our wallet. Um, you, and you, you blame it on a, 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 a guy who is now, uh, his name is just uh, reigns disgust in, in society. So... Uh, if you look at her mugshot, though, she looks like she was doing a heavy dose of cocaine prior. So I, I don't know. It's, this is great, great, great theatrics for lawyers, but uh, it, it seems seems a little far fetched for me. But hey, I wasn't there. What do I know? Maybe, well, maybe it works. the whole claim is that there were five hours between the time she left her wallet on the plane and that investigators discovered the wallet, opened up the wallet, found the cocaine, and that somehow in those five hours, someone planted the cocaine, I guess, in her wallet. Um, of course, you know, Rose McGowan has been one of the first uh, people to speak out against Harvey Weinstein. Uh, she was, she accused him of rape. Uh, that doesn't mean he planted cocaine in her wallet. Right. That's 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 the whole uh, crazy notion of it's if he was still a successful individual uh, and, and didn't have all these scandals going on. And, and this was her defense. It, people would just say well, it doesn't that doesn't make any sense. But since he's now a, a bad actor in society with a bad name, it, I guess it gives it, you know, let's just blame it on the on the quote unquote dirtbag and see if it sticks. You know, David, I don't know if you would agree with me here, but I almost think that it minimizes her actual rape claims against Harvey Weinstein. It's like, I don't know, like, these two things are separate, you know? Like, okay, just because you were found with cocaine doesn't mean that people shouldn't believe your rape claims. And to kind of put them together and come up with this elaborate story, it... it I don't think it bodes well for her PR-wise. Of course, her attorneys were trying to get this felony drug possession case in Virginia thrown out due to lack of jurisdiction. We'll see what happens, I guess, David. 
Yeah, I guess now nowadays we're in a, you know, with the little pink hats and what everybody's running around accusing everybody from Scott Baio to you name it. It's become it's become a phenomenon now. So uh, I, I, I it, being not accused of, of, of a sexual battery is probably the, the minority these days. It's like everybody's getting accused. Well, it's, certainly. Uh, <laughs> Interesting times. It's a, yeah, it certainly seems like that, unfortunately. Um, well, let's move on now to another trial that we're following. And this is not a criminal trial. We usually follow criminal trials here on the Law and Crime Network, but this is actually a civil trial. It's involving a young woman who died, Rebecca Zahau. And the question in this case, is it murder or was it suicide? She was dating a billionaire um, and uh, she was later found hanging from, from, from the uh, stairway. There she is, uh, Rebecca and the son there, I believe. Um, so what happened is the, the uh, medical examiner's office says that this was suicide and the family of Rebecca is saying that it was murder. The medical examiner and police believe it was suicide because she was depressed in that that little boy when she when he was under her care had taken a fall and ended up dying on the stairway of this mansion. However, the family of this woman Rebecca say no no no. We believe it's her boyfriend's brother who was at the house that sexually assaulted her. Uh, strangled her, stripped her naked, bound her, and tossed her off a balcony with a noose. Wow. Police have not made an arrest in this. They've deemed it suicide. What do you make of this case, David? It's got has some interesting facts, not interesting in a good way, but interesting on how the suicide was uh, actually done by her arms being ba you know, bound together and having a, a, a piece of clothing stuffed in her mouth. Um, it's definitely, it, it, they might have alternative theories under civil law related to negligence and different things that might actually get them to, uh, obtain a financial monetary verdict. And, and remember the standard is much smaller. And or when I say small, much less in a civil case, it's usually preponderance of the evidence, which is basically a tipping of the scales much lower than beyond its exclusion of reasonable doubt. So they may be able to meet that burden. Uh, and 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 uh, deliver that verdict because there is some facts that that are are somewhat unique. But uh, the, having the police say that they deemed it suicide certainly doesn't help. Um, so it, 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 this case could go in, in the ways of a financial verdict uh, in the favor of uh, the, the victim's family in a wrongful death case. It just it depends on what the jury actually believes happened. And what's interesting, too, is that the family now is not even seeking monetary damages. They just want a ruling that the millionaire who Rebecca Zahau was dating, brother, is the one that did this. Again, no one arrested. Medical examiner deems this suicide. It's certainly an interesting trial that's going on. Of course, we actually tried to cover it and were unable to get cameras in the courtroom, but we'll definitely be following this one and see what happens if the jurors in this civil case agree with the family of this young woman and award them any kind of damages or find findings there. David DiPietro, it's always a pleasure to have you on the Law and Crime Network as we analyze these cases. We will meanwhile, we will continue to be on verdict watch in the George Burt's murder trial. That's the trial we've been falling gavel to gavel here on the Law and Crime Network. The jurors are deliberating. Was it George Birch that murdered 31-year-old mom from Green Bay, Nicole Vanderheiden, or was it Douglas Dietrich, the live-in boyfriend, as the defense contends? We'll be right back after this break.